case, I guess it's a good idea to start right now. It's the last session before the keynote, so I've got to make a challenge you not to sleep. I'll do my best. So welcome to my talk down on the GPU where are we now? A few words about me. My name is Dimitri. I'm a principal exo developer of the ET systems, and um, I also am a, a Bulgarian Java user called ET. So um, there's my Twitter handle, so you can follow me. So how many of you have ever owned this video card? Remember it was, ah, awesome. I mean, that was, that was the start of everything, yes? In our world. Then, and eventually, for me, it was an awesome pleasure when I saw this screen. How many have ever seen this screen? Yeah, you know what kind of you know, emotion you have it when you have it on your screen. Really, you do. Okay, so um, that was present for my 13th birthday from my father. I'm so happy about it. Yes, uh, so um, what is a video card? So we're going to talk about GPU. So video card is a separate device, usually all built-in device in the processor, which is able to get some data from your memory or from its own memory and visualize it, transfer it, so transcode it to uh, analog or digital signal to be visualized on your screen. Uh, so it's a part of every machine almost. But as of today, video cards are actually not limited only by showing the image that you have. They are also um, able to process and do additional processing for um, transformation made on the screen and they relieve this work from the, from the processor itself. So mainly what you do, so you submit some kind of a form to a video card and then it does all of the processing and renders it to the screen. So video card is kind of an essential part of our systems and sometimes is um, even the most um, expensive part of our systems actually. So video cards can be quite expensive. So and then what is a GPU? So you heard in, in the um, in the name of the lecture GPU. So GPU stands for Graphic Processing Unit. So the first time this, um, this abbreviation was used back in 1999 and, uh, by NVIDIA, and actually NVIDIA GeForce 256 had the world first GPU. Anybody owned 256? Ah, it was so much awesome. So uh, how did NVIDIA actually define a uh, GPU? So it's a single chip processor able to transform lighting, uh, lights, vertexes, and so on and so on uh, with a speed of about 10,000 polygon per second. So that was back in 1999. So AT actually called it VPU, but here NVIDIA won again about the name. So, uh, in principle, the idea of a GPU is in this picture. So, we get a lot of so-called shader cores, te texture cores. We've got rasterizer, we've got video decoding and coding and work distributor. So, the nature of the processing is very, very parallel. You can work with a video card mostly uh, in parallel mode. So, every, every task can be quite nicely parallelized. So um, that's why you have many shader cores, texture cores, and it actually made for all this nature of the computations. So, and maybe probably you have heard of this abbreviation GPGPU. So it stands for General Purpose Computing and Graphing Cards. So it does actually calculation which are not only for processing the images. So they could do all the tasks that are sometimes done by the CPU itself. So, and as we have this uh, things, we want to use them actually. But first, let's have a look at the hardware. So this part of the session is based on um, Stanford University's uh, GPU, uh, well, explanations of what the GPU is. So, if we go back, so processing, we want to process something. In most of the cases, CPU as a general purpose processing machine has this kind of, um, of structure. So we have a, something that do fetch decoding for the instructions. We've got this arithmetic logical unit, ALU. Then we got execution context. And since the data itself comes very, very much um, in random way, there are fancy predictors that data caches, 
um, memory prefectures and everything, something to make your processing faster. So, and since actually the work with all the video card is, is also running a processor, um, runs on a processor, and uh, you actually do the processing, so you actually run small programs on it. So basically, for example, you can convert one pixel to one pixel color to another pixel color. So how actually we uh, can construct GPUs? So we take a CPU and what we do, we simplify. So the first idea, the nature of the computation is that uh, we don't, we have everything very much straightforward. We don't have, the data itself is very much aligned. So we don't need fancy predictors, data caches, and so on. We move them away. So we only have this fetch decode instruction, so what we should we do on this processor? Then we have this ALU uh, unit, and of course the execution codex, all this, um, all this um, uh, registers, and so on, and so on. And since the nature can be parallelized, we actually do parallelize. We put more of this course on our video card. So, and we can even put even more cores in video card. Here, for example, we have simultaneous 16 processor running a very uh, parallelizable computation. But um, in most of the cases, we are doing the same uh, operation or calculation uh, on a different data set. So we do all the same instruction on different data set. So here we come to this SIMD paradigm. So you probably heard of SIMD. Yes, we won't get much in details, but then you have one instruction which is applied on several value, values. So uh, at this moment, you can actually calculate via, via one pass uh, or via, via one tact, you do several computations. It depends on how much actually it does handle. So we do this, uh, we apply this idea directly to, the, to the, uh, this our processors. So, and we have only one fetch decode stream and 16, or uh, in my case, eight uh, contexts and arithmetic uh, units. So, just in one tact, if we use this uh, this way, we, for example, can convert up to eight pixels, like in this uh, picture, only for one processing tag, we actually work on eight pixels. And if we take two of these ideas, so we can come to the, uh, to the idea of the modern GPU. So we have a lot of cores. We have fewer fetched uh, so instruction streams uh, or decoders, fetchers, decoders, and we get a lot of arithmetic uh, and logic units. So um, massive, massively parallel power that we want to use. So, and of course, since we know our hardware, we want to code there somehow. So, um, how actually can we use it? So, um, some cool video cards at some point started, you know, to um, provide the programmers the way they can offload or tell the GPU uh, that it can take some of the tasks from the CPU and perform it on all of this massively parallel um, processing sets that he has on board. And, but the most of the algorithms were actually hard-coded. They were considered kind of a standard algorithms. You, you all play um, Counter-Strike, yes? Yes, in early versions, the water was made with one of these hard-coded algorithms. So programmers just call it, okay, make me some fancy water. Uh, <laughs> yes, and the video card performed uh, all these calculations. So developers were only able to call a very small subset of these instructions for them. And of course, well, to make the games really cool, because the idea of video cards games come from, from the gaming industry mainly, um, um, it was not enough to have only hard-coded algorithms. So that's why uh, some of the vendors open access, let us say it like open access, uh, to, be, uh, to the developers to be able to load their own algorithms. Uh, this low own programs and these small programs were called actually shaders. If you game, you definitely know what shader is. So you have the shader modes and so on and so on. So if you game, you know what it is. So it's small programs to work on a video card. 
So at this moment, so uh, developers were able to actually write their own algorithms for processing all these small pictures and make the transformation sliding and so on. First, these vectors were, with the shaders were different kinds of vertex, geometry, pixel shaders, but they actually come to one common architecture. So several shading languages were actually developed. So the first one is Random Man, you've probably heard of him. Then we have this DirectX ISM, uh, CG was, you know, very much uh, popular, GL, uh, SL, and so on and so on. But mainly, they actually looked like a subset of a C program, which was then compiled to an assembly code. So um, if you see from, the, from um, the left part is exactly a shader written in kind of a C language. Uh, and then compiles to an um, usual, you know, uh, assembly of binary code, which would just execute on these small, very, very unpowerful processors. And uh, the main idea is that uh, these shaders were able really uh, to provide uh, a good transformation of the quality. So, I'm not sure, yes, you can see it even on this screen. So the effects were visible. So. It was very nice for the gaming industry. But as there are so much so low level, um, and it started with the gaming, several abstractions were actually made. So, um, of course, you've heard of this OpenGL, which was created back in 1992. Uh, 19, yeah, um, and this was a very big set of abstractions which we were, with which we were able to actually code and uh, um, have the ability to interact with GPU underneath. So it was, we actually did some, for example, we want to render a square, not square, but cube. We just say, okay, render us a cube, and he will do everything. It will, you know, uh, by these abstractions, it will interact with the GPU. If the GPU, for example, supports some of the accelerations, we'll definitely call them. So the other thing is, of course, DirectX. It was by, made by Microsoft. And um, you know that if you install a game on a Windows, you always have this DirectX on the, at the end. So it was also kind of, you know, application interface with which Microsoft Windows were able to communicate um, with the uh, uh, video cards to make the acceleration. But since we're talking mostly about Java here <laughs> on this conference, how can we use um, this in Java? So we will start with OpenGL. Um, you will be surprised, but at some point there was even a GSR called 231, uh, which was started uh, in 2003 and then abandoned in 2008, with which we were able to actually use uh, OpenGL directly in Java. So uh, it actually did support only to the OpenGL version 2. But then it actually separated. I'm not sure about all the uh, all the uh, all the story underneath, but it separated in an independent project um, called GOGL, which is kind of a life, and uh, it supports a very uh, high level of uh, um, OpenGL up to two four. And have you ever coded with OpenGL, somebody? My God. Why are you here? Yes, it does provide support for glue and glued, so you know what glue and glued is. Uh, and it gives you ability to, to directly work with GNI. So if we take a small look, um, by the way, my career started in sixth grade with coding in basic. And uh, you know all this small problems like write list line to this coordinate, then another line to another coordinate, and so on and so on. Uh, here we are also able to code in this way with this glue and glute. So if we just run uh, our program, we will receive accelerated, I would say, by the GPU, some kind of a cube. So it's written purely in Java, but underneath it uses all these bindings to J and I, and then goes underneath to the, uh, to the um, lower levels of OpenGL. But here, if we are working, we can use actually glue to here. So um, the funny part about it is uh, you probably all recognize this game. 
I mean, the guy made millions with it, as of course, and it's written in Java. So um, <laughs> you can use Java for this. Uh, he used another library which was actually based uh, on, uh, on OpenGL and GeoGL on, uh, underneath. But uh, at some time, about 2005, people realized that actually you've got a massive amount of massively parallel processing units in your, uh, in your uh, machine. So um, the first effort was actually very interesting. So some of the vendors allowed uh, the programmers to read the back buffer or the, the output buffer of the video card. So you can take an image encode your information in this image, write a shader, submit an image in the shader to the video card, and then see what is processed uh, from the back, uh, well, the, the other image which was processed. Yes, people were playing with it a lot, but uh, in the early 2005 came this um, assumption that we have to make it civilized. You have to use it. So, and that was the first research project made in Stanford University called Brook GPU, which was, you know, what we call GP GPU uh, platform. Have it, everybody, somebody used this one? I've only played, yes. <laughs> so it was a subset of C and we were able to write our programs uh, and uh, run them on video cards. And of course this, um, this evolved very much and then we have received a lot of uh, platforms for doing this, like CUDA, like uh, IMD Firestream, which was actually dead again in direct compute, and of course OpenCL. So, um, and the question is, why we should ever use GPU on Java? Well, I always ask them. Well, because it's right once, run everywhere. Here you have to laugh. Um, because it's used on three billions of devices, here you also can laugh, but it's just, uh, when you install Java, <laughs> you have this image. But the main idea is that uh, still, um, there's a lot of data analytics and data science made on the, with Java. And uh, there's a lot of finance and banking made with Java. Um, so uh, practically, GPU uh, is, is a good choice to do this. And by the way, why I came to this idea, because I use it for some of the, uh, and some of the projects for exactly finances. So it was quite applicable as an idea. Um, <clears throat> and um, how can we do this with Java? So we have two choices. You probably have heard of them. So NVIDIA and OpenCL. Um, and of course, it works on JVM, Java works on JVM. So how can we get to all this low level? Of course, you have this JNI and JNA. Has somebody use JNA directly? Well, cool. It's more more easy to write there, I believe. Uh, but with this uh, way, you can access lower levels. But uh, you know, going so much low, it's 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 very hard. So we want to make some abstractions, and uh, we want to use reuse someone's code here. So, and that's why for OpenCL, we have several frameworks which are available to Java. So first one is uh, JOCL, Jogamp, and of course JavaCL, which is unfortunately dead. Jogamp is also, uh, I haven't used it. I'm not sure there's a person who has ever used it. So <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm sorry. If somebody uses, uses? Well, not here. And of course, for CUDA, we have also a very good binding, so JCUDA, which is a set of, you know, of main, main uh, let us say, base core JCUDA library, and a lot of subset of different stuff provided by NVIDIA itself. So it's a binding to NVIDIA's um, set of libraries. We'll talk about it later. So, and unfortunately, I should say about this disclaimer. So it's not running your program is not GPU. It's not just you know write something and fire. It will work. You really need to know your hardware. You really need to understand where it's running because because it's like this. You really need to know where should you run it. But let us start. So first of all, we have this OpenCL stuff, uh, and it stands for Open Compute Languages uh, language. 
which is actually now governed by Kronos Group and it is created by Apple, but it's a consortium of many groups to create a very abstract model of computation itself. So it should run almost on everything. So on GPU, on CPU, or like they position themselves up to the uh, DSPs and FPGAs. Uh, it provides you a way to run on almost, almost every architecture and it provides you a way to do a heterogeneous computing. So to use it, uh, in general, it works like this. You still have to think about host and device. You just not run program directly. There is a host which runs something, and there is a device which um, executes, or it's like a like slave doing the stuff you actually uh, provide, this, uh, provide from host. So you submit data, you submit the program itself, or kernel, then the magic happens there inside, and you wait for the result. So it's a quite an asynchronous work. Uh, but the typical life cycle of an OpenCL application is, is very, very complex. So to make it very general, you really have to do a lot of stuff before you actually do run your program. So you do create context, common queues, you fill in the memory buffers, you take the program which runs on the, you know, the device, you compile it, then you submit, you create a kernel, so you unite all this data. You define an ND range, we'll come to you a little bit later. Uh, you then execute, then you take the data back from the memory of the device, copy it to your device, and then process it. So it's very, very hard. So we just take a look, uh, it'll be a little bit scary. To do a very simple, simple stuff, uh, give me a second. Like, for example, can you see it? I think I'll make it a little bit. Can you read it? It's OK? Good. From the back? Good. So we have a very uh, parallelizable idea. We have two arrays. We want to make some called vector add. So we want to get one component of the array with another component of the array and produce a third array, which is a um, result of adding element from one array to another array. So the, the operation itself is, is like here. So one ID, second ID, and then we get. And this thing, as you see, this is a pure Java code right now. You see we got this string. This is a kernel. This is a program that we had to, to run on our computer uh, on our video card and then we have to do a lot a lot of ceremonies to submit this code to our video card so uh, like for example we want to uh, make 10,000 ads 10 million ads so we define one area for one array um, then another array then we have to do something very strange like pointers and so on why we have to do because this GOCL actually provides this binding to uh, this C++ that uh, C program that not C program but C uh, framework that lies underneath this thing. So we try to switch our minds back to C and have to um, express it with terms of Java. So we have pointer to one array, another array. Then we take the device. Then we take the platform. <laughs> It's very much complicated. Then we, uh, you know, get all the IDs. Then we create context. For example, we need one device to do this program uh, with this set of data. Then we start copying the memory. So we allocate the memory for the video card, for one array, for another array, for third array. Uh, then we create the program, actually. We do compile this code. And finally, somewhere here, there is only line, one line of code which actually does the work. You know, very big ceremony, and then we get back to work. And then we read the data and, uh, you know, fetch the results back. So if we run this program, I'm very blessed that this um, small machine, this Mac has video card, we will see that we just did 10 million calculations on our video card in just 887 milliseconds. 
So now, from Java, we are using our video card. Very simple example, but I'm not going to dive into details. As I told today, uh, Yonandi on the uh, uh, interview, every step away will be a deep dive <laughs> in another problem, unfortunately. So as you see, uh, uh, OpenCL is very, very hard. So there is a host code, which is on Java. There is a device code, which is a specific subset of C language. And uh, all the communication between the devices is, is made by a memory buffers. And you'll be surprised that actually we are not uh, able to transfer almost the same data as we use in Java. So for, um, for uh, OpenCL, you have a special subset of data actually, which is, <laughs> which is available only to it. Uh, so here we get scalars, so there's a unique values. Uh, you start to think a little bit different things, like for example, unsigned, longs, floats, you have even have something called half, which is strange to our eyes. Moreover, you have scalar values, then you have vectors, not exactly like this vector, but vector, um, you know what a vector is? Okay, I won't explain it. <laughs> I don't need to explain it, but the idea is that um, you got a tuple of values which can be submitted to a processor with, via SIMD instructions. It will be calculated in one, actually, in one text. So you have to start to think in different types as in Java, and you have to submit there. And you will be surprised that the way that I say there is also not exactly the same as we start to think. So, um, as the nature of the processing itself is mainly for video, for textures, for uh, graphical images with which which are nicely aligned in the memory, you get several subsets of memory in your video card. You get global memory, constant memory, private memory, and local memory. So. Um, but according to OpenCL model, each video card or each device actually uh, should have this global memory, then private memory, then local memory to some compute units that, for example, we can have not only one video card, but an array of video cards and everybody has kind of a compute unit, but in common this is a compute device, or a video card with two GPUs. Um, available. So it's one device but with two compute units. So that's why they made this common model and each memory works on its own speed. And you'll be surprised that's not all. So um, as you remember CMD, we've got this very hard execution model. <laughs> so um, to be able to perform calculations on video card OpenCL itself knows that you are working mostly with arrays, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or even three-dimensional arrays. So this is the nature of the processing itself. And OpenCL provides you a very good infrastructure. How should you shard your data to spread it to different cores? And this thing is called ND range. So um, you can work with uh, one-dimensional data like this arrays, which we will copying together, not copying, but adding arrays one to another. Or you can have two-dimensional stuff, like where you want to process an image, or three-dimensional, but not only video cards still support them. So you can always express them in terms of coordinates, but any range here is to help you. So if we take this uh, very easy example of matrix calculations, you know that from, I believe, eighth grade, uh, there are always three cycles inside We cycle one a dimension, second direction a dimension, and then we do processing inside. So uh, here video cards, or not video card, OpenCL actually provides us a good way to um, shard our data. And the framework itself actually handles the sharding of data for you. So if we go back uh, to GPU, this matrix multiplication kernel will be like this. We'll only have one actually, um, um, cycle here. You will have this I colon I row. So if we say to our device, we will work in two dimensional uh, with two dimensional data. Please handle it for us uh, in a different way. 
So it will provide us all these other coordinates and we will only need to process them. So if we take it in general and see what's happening here, a typical GPU, well, that's my GPU directly in my machine right now, uh, you will see provide us a very good work items. Uh, where is the mouse? Uh, very good working I uh, work items. Like for example, we can think in dimensions 1,034 and 1,024, or even go third direct dimension up to 64. But we see that the processor itself is very much slow, so it's small processing with almost no caches. And we'll be surprised there was no even SIMD processing here. And by the way, if you go to typical GPU, uh, you see that we are not able to process to shard our data good. So we only have one dimension here, but we have a lot of power in megahertz and we have a lot of memory. By the way, we even have a lot of SIMD processing, all this. Uh, like, for example, we can um, process up to 16 shards in one tact. Yes, uh, so you have to know your hardware and you have to know how you shard your data and is it suitable to be sharded. So, and uh, if we take a look about CUDA, so we make an overview here, it looks easier, especially for C developers. I believe everybody has, well, I saw many hands, you have tried to play with CUDA. Yes? Well, fewer hands, but CUDA, you write code like a C code, your program is like a C code, small program. You also like this, define a kernel, a program which runs on your video card. Then you do all these special functions with uh, memory allocations, with, uh, you know, copying the memory there uh, of the data. And at certain point, as you copy all the data to your video card, you have a strange, you know, unreadable for, for C developers code, like, okay, now please execute this a vector, not this vector, but this program with these dimensions, with this threads, with all this data. So for C developers, it looks like this. And then we, of course, do something with data and free it. But CUDA itself has uh, some different superpowers which are usable for us. Like, for example, CUDA itself provides you um, a very big subset of internal libraries which are very nicely fitted to the NVIDIA devices. So like, for example, for kubeless for matrices, or there is a, even a new library, Deep Neural Network Library, which is a kind of a scary one. I've tried it. I, n I understood completely nothing. But uh, it allowed me to use uh, my uh, GPU for kind of you know, neural network learning. So, and you are able to use them from Java as well. By the way, as a good example, um, uh, this is from real world. One of my friends working gambling, they need very good random numbers. And with a library called um, uh, JRAND, JQRAND, yes, you are able to produce a very good mathematically correct random numbers. So this is a small Java code. This is Java code, uh, which we actually use this provided APIs, these bindings directly uh, from Java to produce us uh, random numbers. It's based on a very deep theory by this uh, Sobol sequences by a Russian mathematician based in uh, 1967. And if we take a look, you see we just run a small program, which is a uh, Java group program, you see, we don't have any kernels, any crazy stuff here, uh, which we're unable to process. We run it, and voila, we have a big sequence of random numbers, which are really number, they're quite close to real uh, randoms, unlike the pseudo-random ram that we have. So, uh, and uh, of course, the memory is a little bit different there. But as we're talking to the memory model, you see the biggest problem itself uh, is that um, we've got a lot of movement of memory of uh, data between our ARM and the device memory. 
So that's the biggest issue. So if you try to code something, you should always be aware. So how much time do you copy? Because if we go back to the uh, example made by the uh, uh, array copying, and we, for example, do this not on a GPU device, but a CPU device. Look how easy I can switch the device here. I just run a different uh, code. Now I'm running the same stuff on my uh, i7 processor. Absolutely the same calculations. And you see it goes 10 times faster. Just because I don't need to copy this memory to the, to the device memory, process it and give it back. So actually the processing, if you take the profile, only takes 27 milliseconds on video card. The other almost second goes for copying back and forth. There's another option if you have a built-in video card, which I'm also blessed to have here. Um, if we run the same program on, a, uh, I sometimes have to warm up, you will have almost processor-like speed. So just because we're not physically copying the data, it just stays in the RAM because our HD card, HD, uh, yes, Intel HD card, just uses the same memory. It actually is not going back and forth via these PCI links. So this is the main program problem. And um, unfortunately, you always have to do optimizations, especially for the devices. Like this small kernel uh, for matrix matrices multiplications. If we know the device that we're working is okay to process vectors, our optimization will go like this, all on the same, uh, all the same program. And you know when I first said, okay, that's just crazy. But this code runs several times faster just because we're doing this vector processing there. But, you know, we don't want to have this thing at all. C. We don't like C. It's too much for us. We don't want to think about these hostess and devices, but we would like to still somehow use GPU. So here, I guess there is a nice way to do this. So it's a Project Sumatra. It's a research project. It's still not, you know, publicly open. I believe Chris, Chris, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's here, but he was working on uh, this research project, which was focused on Java 1. And um, it was focused on one thing. It was focused on streams and the uh, more precise on lambdas and for each in the streams. So actually, it was um, AMD's idea as, uh, to optimize this solution. As you see, we have to do a lot of memory copies uh, between GPU and CPU. AMD provided another architecture called edge sale architecture. Uh, which actually is a kind of a LLVM. You know what is a LLVM, I believe. Yes, for video cards, which uh, um, you know, spared a lot of uh, unuseful code and unuseful memories copies. And if we talk uh, uh, in terms of H cell, so um, not in H cell, but in terms of Sumatra, so as it detects the for each block with a growl, um, you know what growl is. Yes, you've heard in the talks. You know this JIT compiler? Okay. Uh, we produced um, directly HCL code with them, then submitted via JNI to the GPU. And um, if we um, look and start, you know, working with this code on AMD APU, so called, where you don't have this memory copying, we have one memory pool. Um, in the one memory space. If we combine these two techniques, the burst, the boost of the productivity is a little, is, you know, it's hundreds of times. So here you got this gigaflops of, of calculations. And um, together with ACL, uh, Sumatra project, well, performed really great, but then AMD a little bit screwed up, so they don't have financing this. But we want some more general solution. We actually don't want to be bound to, um, to IMD. So uh, IBM created a patched uh, machine, which is now focused on CUDA, but uh, 
it has the same idea. So it's we have streams, and if we uh, create our own parallel, you know, uh, processor in the stream, uh, it can be offloaded to GPU automatically, also detected. So, for example, if we have this uh, range here and we detect parallel, and we detect this lambda, we want to upload offload this calculation uh, to GPUs. It should be done automatically. So that's what actually IBM did for us. So if we have a big N in our range and we see parallel uh, after it, uh, the next block in four each, this lambda here, it transpiles to, um, to CUDA actually code and goes directly to the GPU. So uh, it works only with primitives, only with, I believe, one dimensional arrays, but still, that's quite enough to perform really great. And if we optimize all the read-only caches and uh, copy rate, a good success story here is, the, is exactly this Apache Spark plus this uh, JVM. Um, as they claim, they received a very good uh, timings if they do this mass parallel processing directly with the Spark framework. So Spark is pure with Java. Uh, and uh, the JVM itself, by offloading this uh, lambdas to the uh, to the GPU, saves a lot of time. So, and if you want to play with it, uh, there is even a way to do this. There's a GitHub code called GPU Enabler, which allows you to, if you have Spark in this IBM machine, so um, please try it. You will receive a very big benefit of it. But we don't want to even bother with all this thing, OpenCL and CUDA. How can we actually do this without thinking about in these terms? Is there a way to do this? Yes, you can, and you probably will know uh, there is an API called Aparapi. Somebody heard of Aparapi? Okay, not so much. But it stays short for a parallel API. And it works like a hibernate for databases, but actually a hibernate for video cards. So it dynamically converts uh, JVM bytecode to this host and device code, allowing, allowing you to utilize the full power of OpenCL under cover. So of course, once again, it started by AMD, unfortunately then abandoned. And then in five years, in five years after it was abandoned, it was outsourced by a Apache GPU license, and now it's back to life, what is quite wonderful. And um, once again, the beauty of it, take a look at this. This is only a pure Java code. Of course, unfortunately, I, I was wrong. I was saying we don't have to think about all these kernels and other stuff. You still have to understand what a kernel is. But here, you don't have any other code as well, so you just do the same uh, thing. You just do vectors calculations, but this is now fully Java code, and it compiles and transpiles back to the um, to the uh, video card. So we have a small look at it. Um, one second. Uh, yes. So it's just a regular GPU, a regular Java code. And if we run it, they say voila, and you have all the same calculations, but already done on the, on the GPU. And the beautiful part is it's very much modern, and we, you can, for example, say um, with annotations, like for example, we want this, uh, uh, this part of the of the memory to go directly to global memory, or we want this part of the memory to go to local memory. So um, here you've got control with annotations what you want. Please find more information about this in example. So it does work. It's very much restricted on what you process, and unfortunately, if it cannot process it on GPU, it fall, falls back to CPU, and you won't feel it. Uh, but if we find the GPU and the task, which is GPU available, so you feel free to use it. Uh, it's still a little bit more like a research project, but you have it. 
But what about the clouds? Of course, we cannot sell our product is not cloud native, and here NVIDIA is our friend. So as they launched this NVIDIA grid, it's already available to us. It most, uh, works on most of the hypervis advisors, as well as in the cloud. So with this uh, NVIDIA grid stuff, we are able to utilize so-called virtual GPUs. So it is available to you as a full machine, or as a full device in your configuration. But actually underneath, almost as we see here in Tesla M10, we get 64 virtual GPUs. So 64 virtual machines can use the same GPU. And it's already available in our Amazon Web Services or we are mailed by Citrix. So if I hope my demo is gonna work, I am now connected, so please switch off all of your Wi-Fi devices. I need the full bandwidth. <laughs> it's because I'm connected now to, uh, this is an Amazon machine somewhere in Ireland. Uh, and here I'm doing um, a little bit fancy stuff. So here I have a server, which is a usual Tommy server. And um, I want to calculate some of the stuff and visualize it. Uh, I first calculate it with a GPU and visualize it. So uh, this machine has Tesla K80 processor. It's quite cheap. I pay only less than a dollar for an hour. And it's not even spot machine. It's just on-demand machine. So it's the highest price. And if everything works fine, which I sincerely hope. This is a pure, uh, pure Tommy application. Uh, if we go back, and I believe somewhere here, I've got the URL. It runs somewhere in the clouds. And I go for it 8080 port, and go GPU CUDA. I believe 1.0. Just a second. Voila. So uh, you see a pure uh, Java E uh, application, which actually did a computation on GPU somewhere in the clouds, rendered as a beautiful image, and we got back it as a usual, you know, web application. So that was the idea of our application. What we did, we had to do some heat maps calculation. Heat map is a good example of uh, using a GPU. It's a canonical example. So if you're able to do this, offload this task. So you see, it's possible. And uh, what I want to say that unfortunately, uh, AMD, not AMD, is a little bit behind this. They're still not able to do this. Uh, so they call it AMD multi-user GPU, but it's still not available to us. So anyway, it is here. Let's just take a look at the real GPUs. For example, NVIDIA 180S, 2560 cores, which can do massively paralyzed work for you. Uh, AMD Radeon has 2300. Uh, this APU machine that we're calling, it was, you know, very good CPU, this big array of SIMD uh, processing, uh, of SIMD processors. And even on my machine, this uh, small device, uh, almost more one third of the, of the processor is given to the uh, Intel graphics. So I got some cores and then I have a big array of, uh, of, um, this small video cards, so this small course on the video card. You will be surprised, but most of the Tegra uh, by NVIDIA, they also do have uh, GPU on board, which does, allows you to process a lot of mounts of uh, parallel stuff. And you probably have heard that, yes, that, um, Intel's going to make a big merge with Vega video cards from AMD. So you have one device which actually combines two devices together, Intel and AMD. And um, it will be quite cool. But first, unfortunately, to use this, you have to read books. You cannot just use it directly. But if the task is suitable and it's worth to try it, 
and um, <clears throat> you just try it and you will upload a lot of the work from your processor to the GPU. So I believe that we say it in, uh, in Flemish, danke, danke. Thank you so much for the attention. And this, this, that was it from my side. Hope you find it useful. And, uh, as apart from the Bulgarian Java user group, uh, there we have free t-shirts. So who is closer? Please take t-shirt from us.